This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Up on this episode we are reviewing a brand new title which will be making its way into UK cinemas on July 12th. You may be asking yourself, why is this episode dropping in advance of that? Well one, the title has already been released to America, so for the American people checking out this video, you're safe. And in the UK, if you have a Cine World card like I have, then there's a chance that last night you went away and saw the secret screening of this movie which played in the UK. So the title of the movie is In A Violent Nature. It is the, probably the, one of the movies that's getting the most buzz this year and has been since the beginning of the year when it played at some festivals and was getting all the rave reviews like scariest movie of the year, most original horror movie in decades, all the stuff that you usually see being attributed to a horror movie well in advance. It also is landing in maybe the most horror centric month of the year for the UK. The amount of titles that are being released from just like horror studios or studios that don't nominally release horror movies that are releasing horror movies or horror adjacent studios in the month of July this year is absolutely mind-blowing. In fact, the month, the week that this title is released, uh, we'll also see the release of the new Osgood Perkins movie Long Legs, which we will be reviewing somewhere down the road. But in between that, we've got the new Quiet Place movie. We have... End of the month, we have I Saw the TV Glow, which I will be reviewing this week coming, because uh, I've already seen that one as well. And there's other ones in there that I am forgetting, but there's just a ton of horror titles making its way through. So, yeah, so just get yourself ready for a ton of horror content in the month of July. So, I will put this out here. This is a spoiler review. I only say that because there isn't actually a ton of story here is a slasher movie so there isn't a lot that I necessarily can spoil except my thoughts on the end of the movie so here is your proviso here is your warning here is anything that I need to get out front that stops you putting comments down below that I spoiled the movie when you didn't think I would um, either hit pause go away check the movie come back and check out the rest of the video uh, or skip ahead to the very end of the show using the chapters on whatever device or YouTube or whatever you're checking this video out on. Uh, furthermore, I will say that it is your choice to go beyond this point. And if you have chosen to do that, if you've elected to do that on this video, then the responsibility is on you. Don't say you weren't warned. So yeah, we're going to be discussing In a Violent Nature. We're going to be talking about it. I was going to say in depth, but you'll see why that might be not as rigorous as you might think, and we'll be doing it after the teaser trailer for the movie, coming right up right after this. Get away! What do you want? Get away from me! Welcome back. So you just saw that TV spot teaser trailer for In the Violent Nature. We are going to give you some details on that movie with some stills from the movie playing over the deets. So here we go. In a Violent Nature is written and directed by Chris Nash. Uh, the movie itself stars Rai Barrett, Andrea Pavlovic, Cameron Love, Rhys Presley, Liam Leone, Charlotte Cragen, Lee Rose Sebastianis, Sam Rosten, 
Alexander Oliver, Timothy Paul McCartney, Tom Jacobs, Casey McDonald and Laura Marie Taylor. The movie synopsis as listed on IMDb is when a lock is removed from a collapsed fire tower in the wood that entombs the rotting corpse of Johnny, a vengeful spirit spurred on by a horrific 90 year old crime, his body is resurrected and becomes hell bent on retrieving it. So, In a Violent Nature is, at its very core and premise, a, I was going to say a reverse slasher movie. It's not a reverse slasher movie. I read that on the internet somewhere and wanted to throw something at my monitor. A reverse slasher movie would be where all the teenagers come back to life by being resurrected with knives being pulled out them by a masked, I would assume, angel <laughs> who's doing things in reverse and uh, at the end of the movie he would be inverting a uh, some sort of horrific tragedy which was spot on. So it's not a reverse slasher movie. It's a slasher movie as told from the perspective and from the viewpoint um, of the killer himself. So, what would a movie be like if, and this is another thing I've seen online which I kind of find a bit difficult to sink my teeth into, what would what would a movie be like if you solely followed from the perspective of Jason Voorhees? Or Cropsey in The Burning? Or The List Goes On Ad Infinite? What would that movie look like? And that is in... A violent nature at its core. I disagree with this statement for about three reasons. The first one I would lean into is I would change the confine of that to what would a backwards slasher movie look like if you were following from the perspective of a backwards killer. So that's the first thing. Um, the second, second thing I would say is also if from that perspective, from a filmic point of view, there was no score. Because a score does not denote you're following teenagers. Um, you can still have a score in a movie which follows a serial killer, just watch American Psycho. So, right. So that's the second thing I would say. And the third thing I would say, where a movie has a message and a perspective to put over about the nature of slasher movies, the tropes that are involved with them. However, I would say a movie that loses direction. So that's that's my that's my starting ethos, my three counteractions to the kind of catch-all terminology of what, what would happen if you were just following Jason Voorhees, right? So now that I put that out of the way, um, In a Violent Nature is a frustrating movie for me. Now. I like slasher movies. I don't love slasher. I'm not a, the biggest slasher movie fan, which might mean instantly your inclination is to type, well, this is the wrong guy to talk about it. <laughs> That's not true. Because the movies that this is essentially emulating are the movies that I grew up with and are the movies that I really like. The slasher movies that I tended not to like were the ones that became a bit farcical towards the late 80s. Um, and then the very kind of early 2000s and a lot of them now actually where we are trying to recapture the lightning in a bottle magic of early 80s slashers uh, and struggling to do that because it's 2024 and why would we do that? So there's that aspect, right? Um, I'm, I'm, so I'm not the biggest fan of slasher movies but the movies that this one is particularly focused on capturing vibe feel, I would argue to an extent, tone and execution Ta-da! Huge fan of those movies. Uh, my favourite slasher icon, in fact, my favourite horror icon is Jason Voorhees. So, there we go. Couldn't get any more on the fucking hockey mask if we if we tried. So that's the first thing I would, I would also put forward as a kind of caveat about talking about the movie. Um, it's a frustrating movie in that what it's trying to do is create a statement or a commentary on a particular type of slasher movie and at the same time I think gamify some of the approach so very much in that kind of we were having a conversation coming out of this last night it, it does feel at times like you are following a video game a video game that has no score uh, and having played the Friday the 13th game where you take on the perspective or you can take on the perspective of Jason 
there is a bit of that where you're walking around for a while just looking for someone to stab um, and you can only walk you can't run so there's that aspect and how that translates into a kind of very low budget indie aesthetic I mean, it's, what's interesting here is uh, Stephen Katansky, who is the guy behind Cycle Gorman um, and a ton of other Astron 6 stuff before, is the guy that's doing special effects here. And the effects are absolutely rad. There's no getting around that. They're really, really, really cool. And I know a lot of people have been taken aback a, a by the one big kill in this movie that's kind of the, the equivalent of the Saw scene in Terrifier. And blah, 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 blah. But I think across the board, actually, the effects are done very well. I actually think the movie is very smart at how it approaches kills. It doesn't always go, like, slowly escalating to the most vicious kill. Actually, at times, it sets up things to allow you to see a myriad of different kills, but done in a way where you get the, the concept of it without always seeing the execution. I can dig that. I can kind of get behind that. So I thought the effects were really cool. Um, so it kind of captures that. Although, once again, the effects are great in slasher movies. I don't know if I've ever seen an effect like the yoga kill death in any of the 80s slashers that I grew up watching. I think I would remember that. I think that would have traumatised me. I mean, like like scenes in The Burning, for example, fingers notwithstanding, or maniac with head explosions. You know, they're very much at the, you know, the tip of the tongue. But that death's maybe a little bit. The end goes to show how much you can get away with nowadays, because... In days, days of old, that would never have been on the screen for a fucking second. So, there's that aspect, right? So, notwithstanding the effects, the story is, as that synopsis said, we get a very cliched resurrection of a killer. The case of this one here, a locket that was gifted to him by his mother, this kid that died in horrific circumstances, he's brought back to life, um kind of like trying to find Jason's mum's head. He's trying to go away and get this locket and he interacts with a lot of people that live in the surrounding area. Some people that are aware of this curse. Some people that are not aware of this curse that are there camping up by the lake because they're teenagers and this is a slasher movie. And he is he's working his way around them all um, with malicious intent is how I would describe it. Our killer, Johnny, in the case of this one here, is a giant lumbering marauding killing machine um about 20 minutes into the movie he acquires a hood helmet mask sort of thing and then continues on he has his weapon of choice that he prefers which is a an axe uh but also a chain with two hooks on it and he goes away wreaking havoc and killing lots of people um so all that is tick 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 that's like stuff you would see in like a horror movie, you get a, a slasher horror movie. You get the scene around the campfire where they're kind of covering the, the legend of. That's big old tick. If you see you'll be right back, guess what? You're not gonna. That's a big old tick. Um, if you're doing uh, drugs and you're drinking and stuff like that, you're gonna die. That's a big old tick. And then the, the kind of... The kind of Ahab character here of the ranger who is going to put him back in the ground and all the rest. Like, all these things are kind of archetypes of the genre and we're ticking them off as we're working the way through. So they are all completely present. Where I think the movie falls down is its continuation to explore the mundanity of the slasher killer. Now, you could see, and I would argue you're wrong, and I'd I constantly feel like I'm setting up the case against how I feel, but that feels like the best way to approach a video like this. You could say, well, there isn't a whole lot of movies out there that tackle this, and as such, there is no template for how to work this out. I would argue against that. I think uh, you only have to see a movie like uh, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, which is a movie that is purely set from a slasher killer's point of view, in the case of this one, he's making a mockumentary. Um, which hits all the tone, hits all the trope, um, but is animated in a way where it explains a way... This one leans into the slasher killers don't run, they walk, but they'll eventually get you. Whereas a movie like uh, Behind the Mask, 
Um, his cardio is amazing, so he can basically move very quickly whilst the perception of him not moving fast at all is present. And, you know, that's the joke in that movie. In this movie, there ain't no joke. He's got a very, very, very serious tone out with the kills, and that tone is that he will walk everywhere, and it will take him a while to walk places, so we will intermittently jump through shots of him continuing walking, continuing walking, continuing walking. Get to the next kill. Oh, they've moved away from him. Continue walking, continue walking, continue walking. And... I think there's a reason that a movie like this hasn't been done before from that perspective and I'll say it, I've found those scenes after a while pretty boring and actually like a giant anchor on the pacing of the movie. So at first, maybe the first half an hour, I was kind of with it, I was kind of enjoying it but by about 45 minute mark, an hour mark, I did kind of feel like we should be picking this up, things should be moving quicker, because from the other perspective in a slasher movie, this movie is taking the killer's perspective and not the, the kid's perspective. In a slasher movie, the last half an hour is usually the most entertaining part of the movie, um, and it's because the bodies are all being discovered, the killer's in places that you don't expect them to be, yada yada yada, and we ramp up, right? In the case of this movie, that doesn't really happen, and it's weirdly grounded in that way of, no, you still be walking, it'll take a bit of time to get there so those moments are really really slow added to the fact that there isn't any score here you're left with the sims of the woods which presumably the director is saying well that's what the killer would hear but once again in slasher movies from the 80s 90s 2000s and onwards 70s as well the, kid, the teenagers would be hearing that as well but the filmmaker uses his score over that to keep us interested to set up the kills. I suppose what it's saying is there is no suspense to a kill if you're following the killer. There's no suspense here, you know they're about to die. I can see that argument, you can still have a score that carries a movie around it. The fact that it was devoid of so much sound actually became a bit of a distraction. Um, so there's that element as well. And lastly, my kind of biggest gripe overall with the movie is the last 10 minutes where it is clearly setting up it's clearly a commentary on the ending of these movies generally at the end of a movie our final girl escapes and she gets picked up and like takes a chainsaw massacre she gets driven away screaming and we don't see what happens beyond that point she's safe the killer's still alive credits in the case of this one we get a kind of almost a Jallo-esque explanation of what could have maybe caused the killer to go crazy. Um, some weird fever, what's it, hen, locked in hen or hen, hen pen fever or some shit like that, which they describe out and there's a story from the rescuing woman about what happened to her brother and, and a whole thing about, the, you know, an event that happened in his past, and maybe it wasn't a bear, maybe it was... So they're kind of setting up this... They're talking about tone, and they're talking about themes, and they're talking about survival, and they're talking about nature, and they're having this conversation that you would never see in a slasher movie, because credits would be rolling. So I kind of get why you'd want to do that, but after... All the energy of the movie, which is in the kills and not in the actual movie itself, it is kind of anticlimactic. Now, it's a beautifully shot movie. The effects are very, very, very good. Um, but my, my, my thoughts on it overall when I came out of the cinema was this kind of felt like a really cool 30-minute idea that has been extended out to an hour and a half, and I don't necessarily think it aids it overall. I don't think it's a terrible movie. I've seen some people say this is the worst movie they've seen this year. I've seen some people compare it to Skinamarink, which is also a movie that I quite enjoyed. Um, in principle, I enjoy the experience of the cliff notes of a slasher movie that this kind of covers. The overall experience of the movie is pretty dull, though. And that downtime in between, whilst I think it probably is making a very smart artistic kind of commentary on slasher movies as a whole, is made relatively quick in the movie and its continuation, its propensity to go back over and back over and back over long periods of walking um, as a way to connect scenes just felt to me, lazy's not even the right word, it just felt like a poor choice. Um, and the screen that I went to see it in, 
uh, the most people that I've ever walked out of a movie walked out of a movie. It was the most bizarre thing that I saw. It was over 20 people walked out of the screening at various points throughout the movie. Some at the beginning because they'd heard the heard the reputation of how violent it was. In fact, it was a woman right at the start that said, nope, we're not doing this, and was straight out. And then people dripped off at various different stages where not a lot was happening. Even after some of the big kills, you saw some people being like, right, we're done here, and out they would go. Um, it was a weird audience as well, a lot of older people in the, the audience who clearly just did not know what they were getting in for. And then it finished. And like I say, I, I kind of was left... Not cold, I was just kind of left unsatisfied by by the, the movie overall. I think when it hits all the stuff right, it's very, very interesting and very it's very good. I think there is a statement and a commentary in here, which is kind of interesting on a macro level to... Uh, sorry, macro level to kind of dissect, but on the micro level, over an hour and a half, it becomes a bit kind of wishy-washy and very seamy and you know, like there was a part of me and I don't think this so don't shout at me but there was a part of me that felt like this is what people who don't like horror movies describe horror movies as and I feel like someone is trying to shame me <laughs> like by going to see this in the cinema um the same way that when someone says you don't listen to that heavy metal, do you? It's just all uh, you're like, no, it's not just all. Uh. I kind of felt like that. I kind of felt like someone was telling me, oh, you like those slasher movies? Well, this is what they're like. It's a couple of stabs and a lot, a lot of nothing happening. Um, and 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 maybe that is true. And maybe that's why I didn't love this movie because it it mirrors too much. It's too close to the bone, ladies and gents. But overall, I thought, really interesting concept. Half an hour would have been perfect runtime for this. Hour and a half is far too long. If you think it's the best horror movie you saw this year, I'm happy for you. But there is a high possibility this doesn't even meet my... Well, if we keep going the way it's going, it'll be in my 20, purely because the quality of movies this year has been generally low. But... Yeah, if movies pick up this year, there's a very good chance this doesn't even meet my 20. So... There you go. When it comes to scores, I'm going to give this one, it's like dim the middle, it's a 2.5 out of 5. Um, I don't know if I'll ever watch it again, if I'm honest. I, 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 it's not because I hated it, I just I just don't think it gives me anything. The same way a movie like Terrifier doesn't give me anything. I know some people love those movies and they love Art the Clown and all the rest as a horror icon, um, but to me they give me the thinnest of characters and a lot of kind of over the top kills and it's just not how I'm wired up anymore I think you can give me over the top kills and also create real characters I think that's not impossible I think smart people have done it before smart people can do it again and this kind of falls into that I think it gave me paper thin plot paper thin characters cool kills but it's an hour and a half long and well, I, well, let's do the math on it. About an hour and ten of that is a guy walking around in the woods. So there. Yeah, 2.5 out of 5 for In A Violent Nature. Ladies and gents, that was our review of that movie. Um, hopefully you only stuck around if you've seen it or you don't care about spoilers. Um, if you're checking us out on YouTube, please hit us a like, a subscribe and hit the bell. That way you get movies... Uh, reviews notified to you as and when I drop them. Also start a dialogue. There are a lot of people I know that really like this movie. There's a lot of people I know absolutely hated this movie and I'm like in the middle. I couldn't be any more on the fence if I tried with my score. Let me know what you thought. Did you love it? Is this like, am I missing an aspect that you grasped onto that if that was a lot for me it would make more sense or mean more to me? Um, or are you the other side? Am I being too kind to this movie? Are you like, Duncan, what is happening here? There's clearly less to this than you are making it. Maybe you're putting too much of your thoughts in, which is amplifying the score. Start a dialogue in the YouTube comments below. If you're checking us out on Spotify or on the Anchor app, well, ladies and gents, answer the question that pops up at the end of the episode. And also make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any content there. Lastly, if you're checking out the audio version 
of this podcast wherever you are uh, please hit subscribe there you get access to over 1300 episodes in the back catalogue but also all the episodes that will be coming your way real soon ladies and gents uh, the podcast understays will be winging its way back to you very soon with another episode the next one to drop will be dropping the day after this one drops and it's on i saw the tv glow which will be coming out in the uk end of july so yeah kind of in advance it's going to be a longer form one lot to dissect in that one that one's more heavy on plot and uh, themes than in a violent nature so i like the idea that we're juxtaposing them against each other uh, in so short a notice um until then whatever you are whatever the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours please take care of yourselves out there this is duncan mcleish broadcasting live from under the stairs and i am signing off